you're healthy, happy, and safe. Last week, I read you a book and I gave you two clues where I'd be reading from this week. The first clue was it's a big wide open space. And the second clue was that it's where we have church either in person or virtually. If you guessed I'd be reading to you from St. James's Sanctuary, then you were correct. The book I'm reading this week is My Brother Martin, A Sister Remembers, Growing Up with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Written by Christine King Ferris, illustrated by Christopher Saint-Pierre. My Brother Martin, a sister remembers growing up with the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. by Christine King Ferris, illustrated by Chris Sonpi. Gather around and listen as I share childhood memories of my brother, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I am his older sister, and I've known him longer than anyone else. I knew him long before the speeches he gave and the marches he led and the prizes he won. I knew him before he first dreamed the dream that would change the world. We were born in the same room, my brother Martin and I. I was an early baby, born sooner than expected. Mother dear and daddy placed me in the shipper robe drawer that stood in the corner of their upstairs bedroom. I got a crib a few days afterwards. A year and a half later, Martin spent his first night in that hand-me-down crib in the very same room. The house where we were born belonged to Mother Dear's parents, our grandparents, the Reverend and Mrs. A.D. Williams. We lived there with them and our Aunt Ida, our grandmother's sister. And not long after my brother Martin, who we called M.L. because he and Daddy had the same name, our, brother was, our baby brother was born. His name was Alfred Daniel, but we called him A.D. after our grandfather. They called me Christine, and like three peas in a pod, we grew together. Our days and rooms were filled with adventure stories and tinker toys, with dolls and Monopoly and Chinese checkers. And although Daddy, who was an important minister, and Mother Dear, who was known far and wide as a musician, often had work that took them away from home, our grandmother was always there to take care of us. I remember days sitting at her feet as she, is, she and Aunt Ida filled us with grand memories of their childhood and read to us about all the wonderful places in the world. And of course, my brothers and I had each other. We three stuck together like the pages of a brand new book. And being normal young children, we were almost always up to something. Our best prank involved a fur piece that belonged to our grandmother. It looked almost alive with its tiny feet and little head and gleaming glass eyes. So every once in a while in the waning light of evening, we tie that fur piece to a stick and hiding behind the hedge in front of our house, we would dangle it in front of unsuspecting passers by. Boy, you could hear the screams of fright all across the neighborhood. Then there was the time Mother Deer decided that her children should all learn to play the piano. I didn't mind too much, but ML and AD preferred being outside to being stuck inside with our piano teacher, Mr. Man, who would rap your knuckles with a ruler just for playing the wrong notes. Well, one morning, ML and AD decided to loosen the legs on the piano bitch so we wouldn't have to practice. We didn't tell Mr. Man, and when he said crash, down he went. But mostly we were good, obedient children, and ML did learn to play a few songs on the piano. He even went off to sing with our mother a time or two. Given his love for singing and music, I'm sure he could have become as good a musician as our mother had his life not called him down a different path. But that's just what his life did. My brothers and I grew up a long time ago, back in a time when certain places in our country had unfair laws that said it was right to keep black people separate because our skin was darker and our ancestors had been captured in far off Africa and brought to America as slaves. Atlanta, Georgia, the city in which we were growing up had those laws. Because of those laws, my family 
rarely went to the picture shows or visited Grant Park with its famous cyclorama. In fact, to this very day, I don't recall ever seeing my dad on a streetcar because of those laws and the indignity that went with them. Daddy preferred keeping ML, AD, and me close to home where we'd be protected. We lived in a neighborhood in Atlanta that's now called Sweet Auburn. It was named for Auburn Avenue, the street that ran in front of our house. On our side of the street stood two-story frame houses similar to the one we lived in. Across it crouched a line of one-story row houses and a store owned by a white family. When we were young, all the children along Auburn Avenue played together, even the two boys whose parents owned the store. And since our house was a favorite gathering place, those boys played with us in our backyard and ran with ML and AD to the firehouse on the corner where they watched the engines and the firemen. The thought of not playing with those kids because they were different, because they were white and we were black, never entered our minds. Well, one day, ML and AD went to get their playmates from across the street, just as they had hundreds of times before, but they came home alone. The boys had told my brothers that they couldn't play together anymore because AD and ML were Negroes, and that was it. Shortly afterward, the family sold the store and moved away. We never saw or heard from them again. Looking back, I realized that it was only a matter of time before the generations of cruelty and injustice that Daddy and Mother Dear and Mama and Aunt Ida had been shielding us from finally broke through. But back then, it was a crushing blow that seemed to come out of nowhere. Why do white people treat colored people so mean? ML asked Mother Dear afterwards. And with me and ML and AD standing in front of her, Trying our best to understand, Mother Dear gave the reason behind it all. Her words explained the streetcars our family avoided and the whites only sign that kept us off the elevator at City Hall. Her words told why there were parks and museums that black people could not visit and why some restaurants refused to serve us and why hotels wouldn't give us rooms and why theaters would only allow us to watch their picture shows from the balcony. But her words, also gave us hope. She answered simply, because they just don't understand that everyone is the same, but someday it will be better. And my brother ML looked up into our mother's face and said the words I remember to this day. He said, mother dear, one day I'm gonna turn this world upside down. In the coming years, there would be other reminders of the cruel system called segregation that sought to keep black people down. But it was daddy who showed ML and AD and me how to speak out against hatred and bigotry and stand up for what's right. Daddy was the minister at Ebenezer Baptist Church. And after losing our playmates, when ML and AD and I heard our father speak from his pulpit, his words held new meaning. And daddy practiced what he preached. He always stood up for himself when confronted with hatred and bigotry. And each day he shared his encounters at the dinner table. When a shoe salesman told daddy and ML that he'd only serve them in the back of the store because they were black, daddy took ML somewhere else to buy new shoes. Another time, a police officer pulled daddy over and called him boy. Daddy pointed to ML sitting next to him in the car and said, this is a boy. I am a man, and until you call me one, I will not listen to you. These stories were as nourishing as the food that was set before us. Years would pass and many lessons would be learned. There would be numerous speeches and marches and prizes, but my brother never forgot the example of our father or the promise he made to our mother on the day his friends turned him away. And when he was much older, my brother ML dreamed a dream that turned the world upside down. I hope you like that book.
I loved it. There's several things I like about this book. The first one is that it's told by his sister and she tells some really funny stories that about Martin Luther King growing up that are where he is a little bit mischievous and I like that. The other thing I like about this book is the illustrations. The illustrator went back to the actual street where Martin Luther King lived with his family, took pictures and used those photos to create the, fo the pictures in the book. He also looked at photos of Martin Luther King when he was little and he met with family members to create the faces of the characters in the book. I also love the fact that the way the light shows on all the people's faces in this book. I think it's absolutely beautiful. Next week, I'll be reading you another book in another location. The first clue is that it's either in a gym or on a blacktop. The second clue is there are lines painted on the ground. And the third clue is there's a hoop at each end. Hope to see you next time. Bye.